Hello! And welcome to Lost in Criterion, the show on the internet where we talk about movies. The Criterion Collection. This week we are talking about... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> the you samurai. The, name of the film. Well, it's the samurai it? trilogy. Um, uh, Hiroshi Inaki. Inagaki. I can't. I can't say Japanese names, guys. You're terrible. At I'm Japanese terrible at Japanese names. names. Marty Inagaki uh, is his name. The director. Marty. <laughs> Marty, <laughs> Marty. Marty Inagaki. Stan. Uh, Mar- Marty Inagaki. Which brings us to a great point. That third voice you just heard, and hopefully you can differentiate between the three. Uh, is Donovan Hill special guest this time? I am, as always, Lee Adam Glass, and we've got over in Japan. J. Patrick Dorgan. J. Patrick Dorgan. Marty yeah, Dorgan. My name changes every episode. I keep forgetting what I call myself. He's J. Patrick Dorgan. He's Patrick Dorgan. He's Patrick John Dorgan. John Patrick Dorgan. Actually, it's, man. Plus uh, the name that I sometimes... Uh, John yeah, Patrick Dorgan was... Uh, yeah. I can't... With Harry Dorgan. Yeah, it's, it's confusing. Yes. Who knows your, what my name your is? Your liberal hyphenated names is terrible. Yeah. I'm a dirty liberal. Guys, we've already digressed really far. <laughs> and we're only 30 seconds yeah. in. We're off to a great start. <laughs> we're off to a great start. Marty Inagaki's uh, well-acclaimed, Oscar-winning uh, documentary biopic. Yes, documentary. Documentary. Wait, wait, so, <laughs> See, uh, uh, filmed, 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 filmed in real time at the time. Filmed in real time in, uh, in 17th century Japan. So um, it is a documentary, yes, right? That is actually a, extremely yes, rare footage of the Battle of Sekigahara there at the beginning of <laughs> yes. the uh, first film. Yes. Since all three of these films work together as a single story, uh, we're still going to do three episodes just so our spine numbers don't get don't get messed up. But we are we are essentially going to talk about everything at once, more or less. I think. Um, so uh, watch all three movies you before you listen to, to this. I guess Samurai One. We're listening to Samurai Musashi One. Musashi Miyamoto. Yes, Musashi Miyamoto. These are biopics on Musashi Miyamoto. Uh, telling the story of him going from rash young teenager to... Uh... International art thief. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yes, international art thief and uh, sword swinger extraordinaire. <laughs> Author of The Book of the Five Rings, um, which broke down his philosophy and his sword-wielding techniques. You know when I had to read that, Adam? Yeah? Take a uh, guess when my dad made me read Go Renault Show. This is this is by the way why uh, why Donovan is taking part in this conversation. I would have uh, taken I, part in Seven Samurai because I could have asked you an identical question on that one. Guess <laughs> when my dad made me sit down and watch a three and a half hour black and white movie with subtitles? <laughs> I'm gonna say as soon as you could read. Basically, yes. Uh, I would say I made it to third, <laughs> third or fourth grade before. Dad plopped me down for the old Seven Samurai. It's where I learned the oh, word. Man. It's where I learned the word intermission. That was when I first <laughs> learned the word intermission. Was at the intermission of Seven Samurai, and I said, "What the hell is this?" Uh, and Dad explained to me what an intermission was. And man, then, you had a dirty mouth. Yeah, I was already third filthy. grade Catholic boy. <laughs> to be fair, your dad was making you watch Seven Samurai, and you were like ten years old. Yeah, so you probably deserved. The I was like word. nine. I mean, I don't even think I had hit double digits yet. Uh, and at the round about the same time is when uh, my first copy of really? Gorin- the Book of the Five Gorin- Rings. I was also at this point like well into the martial arts path that he had set me on to. So he he started early with the was, was the Book of Five Rings even comprehensible to him? Um, not in s- any way? some of the like general philosophical points and some of the more general uh, I will say tactical points were about you know use your short sword indoors. Uh, always, you know, lead your... If you're surrounded, lead them to a place where they can only come at you single file. And some of the... Make sure you wear clean underwear. Yeah, don't, uh, you know... Well, if, you, you're, if you're if you're struck down, you don't want them... You'll embarrass your mother. Right. Uh, that's right, never mind that's actually that chapter two. Um, 
so yeah, I have. Uh, I actually still have that copy over on my bookshelf somewhere, along with. Uh, Does it prop anything up? No. <laughs> Do you have your notes? Take care. Did you Did you write marginal notes? I did not, <laughs> as a child, write marginal notes. <laughs> Corrections of translational errors. Um, it's, it's actually sitting right next to, because uh, I'm a I'm I'm punking them through history like this. It is actually uh, touching Jube Yagyu's, uh, you know, similar tome on philosophy and swordsmanship of his school. Uh, which would be in the... Sh- no, that's Hagakure. I forget what Yagyu's is. Yagyu's is the life-giving sword. And touching that is uh, bringing us back to our film, uh, the book of philosophical writings uh, written to Musashi Miyamoto by priest Takuan Soho, uh, which I read, thankfully, way later, like when I was 18 or 19. First Freshman year of college is when I recreationally read that. Not at your weird idea. Yeah, I did have a real. How Adam? I should have asked this before we. Yeah, before I should have asked this before we went on. How are we curse cool on this podcast? We're just family friendly. (laughs) You do what you have no. You do whatever you. Whatever. Okay. Yeah, I had a fucked up idea of recreational literature (laughs) freshman year of college. Because at that time, I read uh, Soho stuff. Aren't you supposed to be reading, like, Fear and Loathing in Las Vegas and things like that freshman year of college? Isn't that, like... Yeah, I probably... Like, sh- Jack Kerouac I sh- or something. I probably no, should I, I, think, I, I read think Toni Morrison's year. Beloved, and then I was really glad to go back to, like, Soho, because Jesus. Uh, freshman year, you're supposed to read Atlas Shrug. That's, uh, no, I read The Stranger uh, by Albert Camus, and Toni Morrison's Beloved, which sucked, and then, um... Yeah, then, you know, Soho's writings to Musashi. And then the next year, actually on the plane ride over to Germany, is when I read the biography of him, which was a surprisingly hefty tome. Um, the biography of... Musashi Miyamoto. Oh, uh, Miyamoto. Which, which is... The priest. How would the accuracy of that compare to the accuracy um, of I th- I feel like the film is obviously uh, infinitely better in every conceivable respect. The biography <laughs> of him uh, conspicuously omits the love triangle. Uh, and also <laughs> makes the bold-faced lie of assertion that during his many years as a wandering, unemployed ronin, that Musashi was actually an extremely dirty and unkempt man. Uh, all the more, you know, shocking when he would then stroll nice. up to fencing schools and kick all their asses, because he was essentially, like, you know, what we would now consider to be a schizophrenic homeless vagrant who had somehow <laughs> found swords. <laughs> <laughs> well, to be fair, in the third in the third movie, he is shown to be uh, a little scruffy. Yes, he is. That is true. That's actually one thing. One thing I really like th- about about the course of this is, you know, the third movie takes place what ten years, ten years after or whatnot. Um, uh, sixty battles later, at least sixty duels. Yeah. Uh, that that, that like Kojiro Sasaki <laughs> holds a grudge. Let me tell you. Yeah, ten yeah, years yeah, later. Does. Well, like, I never... Okay, so well, this is a point that we have to get in when we actually talk about the film, which we're supposed to be doing right now. Um, we are. Is that why <laughs> does he... I, other than the fact that he just wants to prove himself. So, yeah, here's... I was going to actually raise this point, it's too. Very Sasaki's like, motivation is somewhat bizarrely portrayed. Because in other yet. Japanese works, in particular works of uh, popular fiction or works involving you know, master duelsman. Sasaki's motivation is in other places in Japanese uh, cinema and culture uh, portrayed as a extremely pure thing and and almost a noble thing. And that, yes, we as, you know, in modern times would consider his motivation of, I have, you're right, I don't have any personal grudge against this man. I am just compelled to fight him to the death because we're master swordsmen and this is what we do. And there is a certain, you know, nobility and purity of of intention in having, you know, this great rivalry with someone that is not personal and is purely two masters of their art desiring to do the inevitable conclusion of their art. But here it is portrayed as like, what what an asshole this guy is. (laughs) (laughs) He does come off as Uh, quite an asshole. The the thing I, I mean, I understand the duel, you must duel each other eventually, I think, but Maybe this is not the case in other works about him, but it's the impatience with which he approaches it. Yeah, there's... It is the most unsettling thing. Because it's... I understand the... Okay, we are going to have to fight eventually. There's the word eventually in that phrase. 
Like it doesn't yeah. have to be an he's, immediate he's very, thing. And I don't he's get very the impression actively that that wanting means. to do it. And I think that's why well, he comes off as such a jerk. That, that impatience is really doesn't fit the 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 portrayal of samurai character in this film. This yeah. is also uh, there's a, there's also it's somewhat more shadily cast here. Usually when the you know noble drive even if this guy is working for the enemy there's, there's usually a scene in those other types of works where the you know the henchman who's a master swordsman but working for the bad guys will slay his own master or do something to hamper his own side at the last minute because i won't have you killed by some you know this guy of lowly character and morals who just wants to to do x y or z if you're going to die i'm going to do it and we're going to do it you know proper like in a duel or whatever yeah and there's there wasn't there as obvious obviously kojiro has that opportunity to do that here uh in the end of the second film where he could have totally just gone down there and helped out and then at the end been like i i saved you so i could kill you uh because you don't deserve to be killed in you know you are a man of you know that i respect and you know have this great uh similarity of of spirit with and i won't have you done in by some treacherous 80 man ambush but you know on the other hand i do want to fight you to the death myself (laughs) so and there's none of that here so it's kind of just yeah what an what an asshole that dude is yeah well and then he even like they're like they try to like excuse it because like at one point i forget which film it's in but he's like he goes and talks to the man he cripples and it's like oh he's not he's not as cold as we thought it's like no Still an Dilt's asshole. death. Yeah. Kojiro Sasaki, ice cold. Uh, ice cold. Because yeah. also, you, can... you could have seen... The other thing I kept thinking was like, why doesn't he at least just like go over and stab those dudes shooting arrows at him? He could at least, <laughs> like, at <laughs> least yeah. do that much. Or scare him away Yeah, just like throw yeah. a rock at him or something. I don't... Anyway, we're getting ahead of ourselves well, here. Then... Let's... Yeah, we should probably talk about film one. <laughs> so, about the first now that we've since, thoroughly since discussed Kujiro, our disappointment since, with him at the yes. end of film two, we should probably start yes, with film since one. Kujiro, <laughs> since Kujiro doesn't show up until the second movie, yeah. we should probably stop like that. What I, what I was about to say, though, is I was actually really impressed, uh, given he, he's certainly not as dirty as historically he should be in the last movie, uh, but, but given that... Uh, the medieval times are never portrayed as dirty as they should be, uh, except except for in uh, Monty Python and the Holy Grail, when we know we know Arthur's the king because he's the only one without shit all over him uh, to close <laughs> yeah. the movie. Um, but uh, well, but like, I was I really like impressed that, that that is. Oh, go ahead. Sorry, he is he is believably. I mean, he's not believably sixteen in the first movie, but he is believably no, he, young. He is believably Toshiro Mifune in his <laughs> mid twenties. Is what he is. Yes, in his mid twenties. But in the in the last movie, he is he is believably in he his. He looks older. Yeah. He's he he definitely looks a lot older for having only been three years since the first film was made. Yeah, there there was some good makeup work yeah. done. Which is actually really surprising because in the other samurai films I've watched here in my home, that that doesn't that <laughs> rarely happens. Pong. Like uh, that 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 good makeup work is not a staple of, of Japanese samurai films. Yeah. Uh, neither is an accurate portrayal of of shit all over, as uh, you know. Well, no, we discussed that's, earlier. That's well, not and, something the, the, that yeah. happens in any well, in any my culture pro- system. Like, they actually did a pretty good job of making, this was something I noticed in Seven Samurai, too, was they did a pretty good job of making the peasants pretty suitably dirty. Um, but, like, you, you find these samurai, even like the wandering samurai, decked out so that you can identify them on screen in things yeah. that are laughably over their head in price. At, at a time Like when Musashi's entire wardrobe in all films. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Yes. Yeah, exactly. All three films, he's wearing things that's like, oh my goodness, that would have been like all the money he ever made. This ornately something with that print, yeah. Fabric. Well, because a, a print at that time is just... Oh, yeah. That's that's Shogun material, that's it. Nobody else. He's wearing burlap, basically. Maybe a nicer quality of, maybe even wool. Let's, let's not like kid that. ourselves. Instead. He would have been happy with burlap. He would have been lucky and happy <laughs> right. with burlap. But, it's yeah, the plastic like, it's, trash bag. 
Uh, so, but yeah. so yeah, um, again, the uh, biography I read of him suspiciously <laughs> uh, fails to note that he actually had access to Shogun retainer <laughs> level funds at all times. Yes, uh, at all times. <laughs> right. Uh, in fact, in fact, the biography, and, and in some sense, in the forward, uh, in fact, to Yagyu's uh, book, uh, makes makes this absurd claim. That in fact, uh, Yagyu's position was one that Musashi himself may have, uh, may have coveted at, at some point, or was sort of like, you know, the, what he would have eventually liked to have had in his older age, but, you know, never really got around to getting, and Yagyu's family was already there. Uh, which is obviously not the case, cause the films very clearly portray him hanging out with noble lords, like, all the time, and, uh, wearing, again, shogun retainer level clothing, basically, uh, from the get-go. So. Uh, obviously, right. As soon as he gets out of that village, yeah. Man, as soon as yeah. he, him he no just, time at all. You, you may recall that uh, the film accurately portrays that when he goes to war uh, at Sekigahara, he has an entire uh, suit of armor and swords, yes. which a peasant uh, obviously would, of his caliber would have funds and access <laughs> oh, so well, to. You know, yeah. Well equipped, well equipped army. Not, not to mention that. Uh, that's right. why they win. Wearing, that's called logistics. Yeah, not I know. There's a. <laughs> Unfortunately, Toyot- it was that very same logistical ability uh, that would see the Toyotomi faction after they lost the war, uh, upon the side of which we are led to believe that uh, Musashi fought, uh, convert the majority of its standing army into the uh, scribes and historians yes. of the day to accurately to record, accurately record the the Musashi's film. further that's, exploits yeah, uh, for us. That's how we know. That's how we know that because every every twenty feet there was there was a scribe yeah. and a quick. It artist. was it was a simple uh, thing yeah. for the uh, for the Toyotomi. We, like to call, we, call, we call it speed artists. for the Toyotomi clan and his retainers to shift that logistical focus from arms and armament to uh, wood cuttings, uh, uh, parchment, and uh, ink brushes. That's that's why this entire movie, everyone's in caricature, because that's what we thought they looked like, uh, right? From from the quick arts, from from what we had at the time, right? Just giant heads, <laughs> they all have really giant heads bodies and swords, and, and, and <laughs> always smiling. Yes, always, always smiling. It's easier to draw that way. <laughs> so uh, this we'll, first we'll... this first movie um, is is the only one to win the Oscar, but it also came out in America 10 years uh, before the other two for some Adam, reason. Adam, you should probably um, uh, clarify the extremely yes, patronizing yes. post-war Oscar <laughs> yes. that that was. Yes. Uh, this one, this won the, uh, the Best Foreign Language Picture Oscar in 1955. Uh, in 1956, the Best Foreign Language Oscar became an actual Oscar. But this one in 55, when it was an honorary Oscar... Uh, which I believe meant that they just spray painted a Barbie doll, um, <laughs> but it Come wasn't. On. It wasn't an actual competition was, at was, that point. It was probably, probably a GI Joe. Uh, in probably in honor of uh, you know attempting to you know reach across the divide. It's been only it's been about only ten years uh, since World War II, so obviously there's still some leftover tension. Uh, we we may uh, have sources that indicate that in an in an act to. Um, Again, but somewhat patronizing, given that they were giving them a, a, a hand-me-down fake Oscar, t- because, you know, someday you foreigners will get there uh, and be ready to, to join the big boys in Hollywood. Uh, we do believe, there is some evidence to support that it was, in fact, a uh, spray-painted uh, w- wood print carving of uh, a G.I. Joe as kind of a cultural oh, gesture. There you go. There you go. Some, some, <laughs> here's one you guys can take so back home we, to, your, we, to your little pretend country over there. So we... They they don't they win but they don't win an Oscar. But the thing is is like do we think that it deserved to win an Oscar? I would say that the first film is I would think, Oscar yeah. worthy. It's the a quite a good film. Does. Um not it's only not only in radically writing, disappointing I, from a Western film goer perspective. So oh, I'm the, not sure how it won an Oscar because when movie, you look at like the actual plot, it's not the kind of thing that Western film generally give Oscars to to see. Yeah. Yeah, it, because like it's basically, got, it's got a downer ending. ending. You, you, it basically ends with a, a theme that you don't really see in Western films very often, which is surrender and yes. accept your fate. And asshole priests. Yeah. So, kind like, of locking yeah, people up in castles. That's not what you would think. Um, that would, that's not what you would think hanging of. them from a tree. It's, all, it's also uh, something of a, an interesting in that I wonder uh, how this movie was marketed because I feel like American audience would also have felt a profound sense of betrayal after leaving that film, since it was, 
I would have to assume, marketed as, this is the story of Japan's greatest swordsman who fought, you know, who killed a trillion people and was, is, you know, a cultural figure over there. And then they come out of this film going, but it, there's just some dude living on a farm for a while and then he gets locked up in a castle by a priest. What, like, what the, <laughs> yeah, what yeah. the fuck? Where was where was the grand swordsman who slays a million men and all do and granted they I, what they didn't know was that the second movie was coming, but the point is, ten years ten later. years later the point is to an American audience who had to have been sold on this film with this is the story of the greatest swordsman ever known, and the film is absolutely not the film about the greatest swordsman ever known. It isn't a film about a berserk vagabond being tricked into a life of imprisonment by a a priest, they probably felt maybe a little misdirection was implied in getting them to see it. No, I'm guessing that it was marketed as a comedy. (laughs) Well, it's in a foreign language. That zany Takuan Soho, guys. Let me tell you. (laughs) Well, that's what Uh, I'm saying. Like, I'm no doubt that it was marketed on the, oh my god, Japan made a film. Didn't we, didn't we completely cripple I them 10 years ago? I thought they couldn't. Yeah. I thought the radiation melted all their celluloid. <laughs> with, but I guess... Yeah, I'm guessing that they were like... Yeah, I'm guessing it was totally novel factor that got any butts in the seat. Um, <laughs> at any rate... Well, we, we'll never the, know. The film, the film opens with uh, a young Musashi Miyamoto participating in the uh, sort of end of an era, beginning of an era battle... Uh, of Seki Gahara, which there is some, there is some, uh, speaking honestly, there is some halfway credible belief that that may have actually happened. Uh, whether, whether or not he bravely led a counter charge directly into the enemy ranks during the rout of his own army, uh, is probably subject to some discussion, uh, by historical minds, but, um, I think for the purpose we are for not. the purpose of the film, I think we have to assume that the uh, shift in the Toyotomi faction from warriors to uh, historians had probably already begun, and therefore that the uh, events yeah, events portrayed yeah. there are probably a hundred percent trustworthy. Yeah, well, I'm sure that those guys you see right there at the beginning during that battle screaming, "We have to run away!" Oh my God, all is lost. We're actually writing everything down. At the time. I mean, yeah, they yeah. realized that as the battle with events. the battle being lost, surely they uh, just began. It was a conversion on the fly <laughs> during mid route. They began to 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 uh, to switch tactics. During traumatic events, you always you pain. always remember exact details during traumatic right. events. Right, uh, you don't never wrong. Yeah, you're never wrong about no what mistakes. happens. Uh, I think, I think actually, no, you, you lead a good point. I think, given when this movie came out, when it was made, 55, um, and, and still so close to the glorious loss of World War II, um, and, and millions dead in, in an instant, hooray, go, go USA, um, that, that I think we can gloss over some, when we make a historic epic uh, designed to celebrate a cultural hero, I think we can gloss over a few things um, when we're trying to uh, fix the motivations and uh, the... Uh, I lost the word I was looking for. Anyway, we're trying to make Japan feel better about themselves, I think, at this point. Well, and this is also a time when like we we need to be careful because like I don't want to get into like heavy into motivations and stuff like that. But yeah, basically this is also a time when Japan is doing the same thing for themselves a little bit. Yeah. And so yeah, there's definitely they, I think there was a there was a lot of films made at the time that were very very um I don't know what the word I'm looking for. They were very positive about yeah, Japanese which ultimately that's, that's fine. which is ultimately where in some places I think that's obviously where Kurosawa starts during which in making the you know certainly several huge films and other there are other filmmakers that sort of take his lead on this uh, I forget the guy's name that did the sort of doom uh, which you guys will get to eventually and hopefully I'll be back for but the the period of you're never the, coming back the period of film well Fair enough. Uh, the period of <laughs> the filmmaking period of film. that that deconstructs the samurai as mythos as portrayed in popular film and culture, which is a huge part of what Kurosawa spends his life doing, uh, 
via stuff like Seven Samurai, Yojimbo, uh, and, and other, you know, other films from that era, uh, and other filmmakers that sort of follow Kurosawa's lead on this. Ironically, this is exactly the kind of, you know, whitewashed history stuff that Kurosawa would later spend a significant portion of his film career uh, attempting to deconstruct and oh, and yeah. and, oh, uh, yeah. and and portray portray essentially the same kind of archetype that and and ironically for Mifune as well would would later go on uh, perhaps to gr- far greater uh, acclaim and recognition as portraying characters that are the you know that are the very deconstruction and inversion and sullying and moral grayifying, I guess, of the character he plays in this trilogy. Yes. No, absolutely. And I think... Certainly Yojimbo rubs his jaw, his stubbled jaw, a lot more uh, than Musashi ever does. And Musashi is essentially perpetually clean-shaven. So right then and there, you can already see the, you know, the the dramatic shift. Yeah, I think it's it's important to, to to recognize this movie in its historical context, and that's that's it. This is this is a celebration of history right before we get into the deconstruction. Well, how did we get to where we are, and what can we do to change where we are? That the Seven Samurai gets started and 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 pushes into other directions too. But on this movie, yes, what do we want to say about it? Actually, I want to talk about um, one of the one of the essays uh, for the Criterion stuff uh, talks about how this this movie is the pinnacle of Eastman color. Um, that the the coloring in this film is uh, is it hand color or was it? Well, it's 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 Eastman color, uh, which means uh, I, I think it was a post production coloring. Hmm. Um, no, I'm probably wrong on that. Eastman, I, I think, was 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 actually recorded in color. Uh, Technicolor, obviously, is a, a, a weird sort of post production uh, pulling out of color. But Eastman color, I think. Eh. Anyway, it's very nice. It looks very nice. But we we were talking about the bat that opening battle scene. Uh, the storm effects in that opening battle scene are ridiculous. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, they are. It was really <laughs> startling, like to watch. I was like. Really, this is that. This sort of brings me to to a to a certain level of, I this film conjures at least for me, uh, sort of when all three of them to some extent, uh, but the first two in particular, where I think the effect is a lot more noticeable, uh, when it's done, is that almost it draws comparisons in terms of its its you know uh, scenery and so on to the Wizard of Oz in just how blatant the sound stages and interior studio shots yeah, and how yeah. at some points like almost comically fake the like the landscape they are yeah s- walking yeah, around on awesome and interacting it and the back paintings and so on it's almost yeah I, I, I it's how how they're very clearly back. They're very clearly back paintings. Yeah, the mat, the mat paintings. The uh, really... the the yeah. scenery that in some scenes they are you know taking place in is so obviously a studio and styrofoam rocks and so on. Uh, which well, it's really weird because then they also use actual then the, yeah and landscapes, then... which startlingly startle. I can't say that word startlingly contrast with their yeah. It's fixing. it's more yeah. I was it's going like, to say if and if they we go outside if they had done the whole thing one way or the other, I think it would be less jarring. But when they yeah. go from say yeah. the scene uh, in the first film, the manhunt scene, where it is very clearly an outdoors uh, that that scene that camera angle they come back to a couple of times with him looking down into the with the tree yeah into the field to see yeah. them all below him and then eventually the the priest and and otsu are at the same identical fixed camera angle uh looking down on the exact that that kind of you know very striking outdoor uh cinematography and then to contrast that with what appears to be a third grader's play uh, <laughs> worth of background materials in a studio. The trees aren't even yeah, 3D, it's, they're just they're, flat. Yeah, painted. it's just really jarring. Uh, and they, it's, they've more or less dispensed with most of that by the third film, 
the, yeah, the third film well, was, yeah, with the third film they pretty much moved outside <coughs> moved outside in, in, yeah, its, in its duration but the first film uh in places and especially randomly the the second film seems really heavy on it the the opening duel in the second film is well, yeah, yeah. At least his, sometimes when he's hiking through the mountains yeah, or his, whatever, it's he's like, hiking wow, through them. Check out this. You're like, man, there go thing we built. There's the mountains right there. There's the painting of the mountains. He's walking towards. <laughs> My niece did this. What do you think? Yes. <laughs> yes. Yes. No. Certainly. Certainly. There's issues with that, and and it's it's so it's it's so jarring because the outdoor scenes are filmed, especially in the first movie, really are filmed so well. Correct. It's, that, that yeah, really I don't mean to. I don't mean to, don't mean to seem nice. unduly like man. Those <laughs> probably bankrupt as a nation, piss poor Japanese. Ten years after their country was, you know, shattered to oblivion. How? What a bunch of jokers that they couldn't come up with outstanding, you know, incredible, you know, cine- <laughs> stu- sound studios <laughs> and so on. I'm not trying to go there. I'm just saying that. But that's the weird thing is I don't know why they chose to use yeah, sound it's, studios it's more in of the a, first place. I would have thought it would be easier just to do it outside. Correct. That is, I'm more yeah. saying it is jarring that they chose to go that route at all since they exactly. surely, exactly. they are not blind to the same things we are observing, which is that it is not, they are particularly obvious pieces of artifice. <laughs> In yeah, in, yeah. in in a way well, that this is just not a good painting. Yeah, what are we gonna in a do? way that jars with the <laughs> other scenes in the film that are demonstrably outdoors and natural environments. Well, and that's the thing is the outdoor scenes are beautiful. Correct. I think and yeah, I think that's something that Japan it, really yeah, has going for it in a lot of its outdoor cinematography. One, my probably my favorite part of uh, the. Not to completely loop sidetrack here, but my favorite part of the film, uh, The Last Samurai, other than Tom Cruise's Magnificent Mane, is the <laughs> landscape cinematography. Because Japan has a lot of, you know, just really breathtaking, you know, landscape that they can take advantage of for that kind of scenery. And I don't know why they wouldn't take advantage of it every time they could. They surely have really awesome mountain passes they could have actually filmed him walking around oh, in. Oh, yeah. I mean, I could walk to Yeah. Walk. What's, yeah. So, what the, so what the hell, guys? It costs more money <laughs> I think, I to think, build all of this crap <laughs> than it is to just go just over been... there and film him walking around for ten minutes. So why are you doing it? I maybe they didn't have the gas. I think we're seeing the influence, though, maybe of Western filmmaking on the Japanese filmmakers at the time where they're saying this is how you have to do it. Yeah, that's this is how cinematography is done and it's all done inside of this room. And then so they you know, I think we may be looking at a situation where we kind of almost have it backwards, where like they would have gone outside if everybody on earth hadn't told them they needed to be inside. Yeah, I th- yeah, yeah, I think that that's again why I the thing that jumps out of my mind when I'm uh, when I'm watching it is like this is like a shitty Wizard of Oz set, like, which, because I feel it's like that was probably, yeah, now. those, that, Gone with the Wind, those kinds of, uh, you know, studio artifice settings, yeah. uh, and, and soundstage stuff, I think probably was an influence on them, on, and probably, you know, unfortunately for yeah. the worse, um, you know, in Gone with the Wind... <laughs> The, the South sucks. It has really not a whole yes. lot of great landscapes. So the fact that they had to build something visually interesting for you to look at, because the <laughs> South is really boring geography wise, uh, is, is, you yeah. know, whatever. They had to make up something because no one wants to just stare at them wandering around in a swamp. But Japan does not have that problem. <laughs> God damn it. <laughs> well, yeah. And I think, yeah. Well, I mean, you. But you see, by the time you get to Kurosawa and stuff, they've moved they have, in their own yeah, direction. They, they've said, "Like, look, we're just going to shoot this yeah, outside." Right, and Kurosawa, we have no reason to go inside. Yeah, it's very different. Uh, all, you know, Kurosawa films heavily outdoor. Uh, you know, cinematography, and even when they're, uh, when they're indoor shots, uh, are filmed with either a a intimacy that is. It's not really carried through in the cinematography of this film. Uh, scenes like um, the, I want to say it's Seven, is Seven Samurai the one where he's picking flies out of the rice with his chopsticks? Or is that it? No, no, that's the second movie here, or the third that's movie right. here. Um, 
that that kind of they get there in time, but in but yeah. you know that kind of a scene structure there is not the same as, uh, you know the the, the yeah. indoor scenes in the first film are less artfully done than say the yeah than than, yeah, than scenes they're... even indoor scenes even later on. And so they can't. Yeah, they can't the really. And third film, they've changed their style yeah, a lot. They can't. Especially yeah. by the third. They can't film, really figure really out how to do either. They can't really figure. Out, they know how to yeah. do big landscape shots. Well, and do, and they do them very well. They they aren't really sure how to properly do an indoors, you know, intimate s- scene. Uh, and they don't really know how to do sort of the the worst of all are the mid range shots where they resort to those crappy sound studios. So I think that the cinematography yeah. of this film is troubled uh yeah but only but only half troubled yeah that's 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 the the weird weird thing is i think in the end like one of the reasons why it may have gotten that honorary academy award is because the parts that they do well they do extremely well and it's the 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 problems that it has are only become more noticeable precisely because it is done so well elsewhere in the film but I wonder yeah. also if at the time, because people had gotten used to watching things like You're Gone with the Winds, and if maybe everybody's just sort of glossed over it, they're like, nah, more yeah. crappy backdrops. It's actually interesting, this movie was called The Japanese Gone with the Wind, and I think it was meant as a compliment, a comparison of, you know, historical accuracy, <laughs> more than anything, <laughs> but, but in a complimentary style, uh, you know, the the South became, here's because a, of Gone with the Wind. fantasy epic, yeah. set the, in a real time. Yeah, exactly, place. exactly. Um, and 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 it made it made the South seem, you know, like well, it, it glorified. I was going to say I would I ascribe far more sinister things to Gone with the Wind than I do to this film's historical revisionism. Oh yeah, oh yeah, no, no, definitely true. Definitely I, this true. was this was this just film gloss- does have some pretty hefty historical. It, it's, this thing is nothing but textbook historical revisionism. But there is. They are not really glossing. They are adding a whole bunch of things that probably didn't happen. Love Triangle, for example. But they are not necessarily yeah. glossing over the people, places, and ideologies that were expressed. That's, that, that's Musashi true. is not this, Musashi is not portrayed as a great dude for a even even into the second film when he's you know sort of in his prime and doing his thing he is still being regularly criticized by basically everyone around him as a brute murderer and a thug and i don't so even though there is well, even there in... is all this revisionism but it is not the fundamental story arc of musashi miyamoto is not necessarily tampered with gone with the wind yeah. wants you to believe that the a a confederacy of institutions that are almost uniformly morally reprehensible evil of the first order should be whitewashed because man isn't this dude a charmer and that that kind of like <laughs> extremely sinister bait and switch historical whitewashing of from gone with the wind is just not even remotely in the same in the same place well, yeah, as, I would, as these films I, would agree I think because this film is also not really this I would say this film has much less agenda as well. Yeah, just because this film is not trying to ex- like here's this really cool f- kind of fantastical story we're going to tell you about somebody you've already heard about since you were in grade school. Yes, there's there yeah. is a um, I th- it's basically a George Washington. Yes, movie. there is a hard. Yeah. It's like if we yeah. made a movie about George Washington, this is what. it Well, would be if like we made a movie about George, goodness knows we can't just make it historically accurate. Well, if we made about well, about George Pat, Washington, in you the might 50s. be slightly better this placed be to speak on this than I am. I feel like if the Japanese, they can't really make a movie about George Washington because for them that would be Nobunaga Oda, and he did some dick things that aren't really well, things you can glorify right. in in film. If they had made a, if they had made this film trilogy about Nobunaga Oda, I feel then the Gone with the Wind sinister whitewashing of history would probably be a little more apt. (laughs) If they omitted the part where he crucified his sister upside down or whatever and routinely put civilians to death in terrible ways, uh, in his, you know, unifying of the country, they, so wait, the Jap, the Japanese, the Japanese George Washington was actually was also the Japanese uh, Vlad. Kind of, Impala. yeah. Oda was a dick. Uh, he's he has since become, uh, you know, sort of he nowadays he is oft portrayed in popular, uh, popular culture and fiction as inevitably the villain of whatever the fictional period setting hero is. He's everyone's always got a 
fight Nobunaga Oda at some point. But, uh, yeah, he's, he is, you know, a legitimate historical figure who did unite, begin the, the tripart process of uniting the country, which ends two people later with Tokugawa and the Battle of Sekigahara that opens this film. I, are, mm-hmm. Is that is that a? Yeah. I mean, Pat might be more better well, place to speak on this, being a you know a person who teaches at school. But it, is that a acceptable well, yeah, but, bastardization like, I mean, and grotesque shortening of of the, the main, how they got out the of the age of country more, at war? Yeah, like I think the main thing we're looking at though with this, especially with um you know the, with the Musashi uh, Miyamoto thing, is just that yeah George Washington's maybe not a great comparison, but. It is in the sense that these are equally well-known historical Correct. figures. Correct. Kind of yes. Thing. Yeah. Like this is yeah. somebody that every Japanese person knows, and so you're never going to make a quote-unquote accurate film about him unless it's on like basically PBS Lifetime. Or, well, yeah. 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 Like you're because it you're trying to make something that's fun to watch, and watching a scruffy guy wander around and and kill people, people at seemingly random. Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's not a great film, and they are trying to make a good film right. here. I, there um, are definitely, yeah. in any kind of, especially in this period of filmmaking, both in Japan and America, there are always going to be sacrifices, histor- historical accuracy is going to be sacrificed on the altar of romantic filmmaking in this period. Right, exactly. That is inevitable. Yeah. I, I would, I think that if you are making, if the comparison was made to Gone with the Wind, in terms of being a sweeping quasi romantic epic i suppose but i i would say that that is uh, casting undue aspersions on the musashi on trilogy film, yeah. because uh, that, i would say because that's i true. think yeah. gone with the winds uh sociological agenda is morally reprehensible in a way that the <laughs> you know the whitewashing of musashi the actual person <laughs> let's, let's is, make him is, look a little bit better than is he was. is yeah. not they do not and especially since throughout all three films they are not glossing cool. over or morally justifying his lifestyle and in fact he is routinely critiqued as being little more than a blood-soaked butcher by basically everyone he encounters at any given time. Yeah, that's true. And, and like, well, I mean, we're meant to root for him. And say, he's not a butcher. He's a, he's a hero. He's troubled. But it's it's also fine. I mean, like, it's we. It's not like he learns his lesson. He eventually. Did. Musashi well, Miyamoto it, it eventually a... grows into someone who is less, who is less, you know. Who, who has a clear moral arc. At the end of Gone with the Wind, slavery is still awesome. According to... Well, it's kind of... That brings up an interesting point about his moral arc is... Again, kind of getting into the Western culture watching this film is... His moral arc total for the three films is actually not so bad from a Western perspective <laughs> as far as, you know, entertainment and, like, whether or not we would actually, like, enjoy watching it. But, like... It, you have to know that it's coming. You know what I mean? Like, if you're a Japanese person going to watch this <coughs> film, you know yeah. that he's going to turn out to be Mr. Awesome. Well, not Mr. <laughs> awesome, but pretty interesting character who, like, kind of achieves that sort of peace. And Which is, I think, a, I think that achieve. is a uniquely Japanese story arc in some ways. I think if this film was an American film about a, you know, equivalent American person, the story arc would be backwards. He would start out, you know, just an average Joe until Sekigahara. And then, now he's on a quest right, for... Re- and then it becomes... We root for him because he becomes increasingly bloodthirsty and murderous. And g- he's gonna go fuck him up. Like, you know... Well, and that's what I'm saying. As opposed to really... the Japanese. I think this is a uniquely Japanese... Or not, maybe not uniquely, but it is a theme that is more often expressed it does in, show up in japanese film a lot. In, in japanese yeah. film and and literature more is that this is some that the being able to kill everyone is not necessarily the desirable the ultimate the goal, ultimate yeah. goal and in fact you know the and this uh, i'm gonna befuddle and terrify your viewers with another glimpse into my horrifying childhood uh <laughs> one of the things that was one of the earliest before i was ever allowed to hold the the wooden training sword was was the less the lesson that I had to before I was ever allowed to hold it. I had to read Go no Show before I was ever allowed to hold it. There were, you know, these, you know, I watched Seven Samurai before because 
the thing my father in his own probably uh, child services should have been called way uh, was trying to impart was that if you, no matter how strong you are, and no matter how much, you know, the martial arts that you're going to learn, and I'll teach you how to use this, if you ever draw your sword, you have already lost. It doesn't matter if you actually, you know, defeat your opponent. You should be of a... It's that Zen concept of you, the greatest warrior is the one who never draws his weapon in his entire life because he is a man of such, you know, peacefulness and learning and avoids conflict or resolves it without bloodshed that he is never forced to draw it. And I think that that is a absolutely uniquely, in part because of its Zen influences, I think that is a uniquely Japanese uh, character arc. That you don't see in Western well, cinema. Well, certainly not something you'll see in film, in Western film. But like the other thing I was going to get into was is that 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 concept, knowing that that's what's going to happen, is something that the Japanese audience who is watching this film maybe didn't know exactly what was going to happen, but they had an idea because it appears in literature and everything else that that's going to be a possible character arc. We're going to watch this man become a complete person, but like. For the Western audience, I can't imagine what they were thinking when, like, as they went through these films, especially as we were talking about with this first film, with like, where where is this headed? You know what I mean? Like, and then it's kind of no wonder that the second film was released ten years later because, like, I can only imagine the outcry after this film. They went saw this film like, um, so when does he start becoming a badass? When does he start killing things? Correct, because there's a certain amount of, uh, it is isn't. It is a bizarre, you know, counterintuitive character arc for, for most Western and perhaps even international audiences to some extent, that the ultimate goal for the greatest swordsman ever is to live in peace and quiet and never have to draw his blade again, and live a, live a life of quiet contemplation and peacefulness and not and give up the lifestyle that has defined him, rather than achieve that lifestyle by leaving a life of peaceful contemplation and, you know, a undramatic life. I would say that that is uh, yeah. that's that is, and yeah. that's the film doesn't quite get point. there because the third film kind of ends really abruptly, uh, without really resolving whether or not he gets to do that. Um, Well, the uh, the third film does leave him on his way to peace. Well, and then also with the third film, which we sh- probably shouldn't talk about too heavily, but yeah, with the third film also, yeah. that's a kind of, I think, an assumed aspect, is that like he's defeated the, his greatest challenge ever, which means from this point on, there will be no challenge that he cannot overcome, which means that he should never, ever have to fight again. Finally, he can become what he was born to be, what he has longed to be uh, these many a years. farmer. Is, yes. <laughs> a root farmer. He really likes that. Um, well, before we, uh, we're, we're, we're getting a little high in time on this episode, uh, and there's a little bit we, we actually need to cover before we get to the other movies, and that is the introduction of our love interests. <laughs> as, as, that's a, that's a oh, terrible, oh, oh, as terrible and uh, historically inaccurate as they may be. Uh, they do serve an important purpose. To the, I'm not to the sure you can call Akemi uh, a love interest because he never loves her. You know that is true. She She's she throws herself on him in this movie. She throws herself on him. Uh, uh, her her motivations through the entire thing are very confusing. Bad uh, women women in this movie uh, women in this uh, these movies aren't aren't treated very well. Otsu especially Otsu at the yeah, at the end oh, of the first man. movie. I gotta say that was one I of the felt, hardest things yeah. about this film was like. I started treating her as the main character. I was like, oh my god, poor Otsu. Yeah. I, kept, I thought that every five minutes. I was like, oh, poor Otsu. No, I, I, oh. I On the other hand, it is a point of contention of... with me that Mama Otsugi just never gets what's coming to her. <laughs> <laughs> no, she does. She <laughs> dies. Oh, oh, no, I'm sorry. I'm thinking about... I'm talking about Oko. what's his, what's his yeah, face's no, right. yeah, the, mom. Yeah. Man, someone needs mom. to... Yeah. S- Madahachi's mom, mom has Otsu's. it coming and never... Oh, yeah. S- Never, never gets, never gets, 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 never gets the that blade that she do- desperately deserves. Oh God, yeah, she's the worst. I was really Otsu hoping, though. like, at that scene Otsu in the second though. film when the little kid goes out 
swinging with the with the wooden sword at them. I was like, yes, now now she's gonna get smoked. <laughs> she'll get, she'll she's gonna get child. smoked by this kid with a wooden sword and just get done in real bad, like <laughs> bludgeoned to death by a child with a wooden sword. And then, to- unfortunately, uh, he is a child with a wooden sword, so they just sort of grab him, and that's the end of that. But <laughs> yeah, but that. Well, she's also she also ends up being the only female character, the only named female in the entire movie in a series of movies that doesn't immediately fall in love. Or try to have sex with Miyamoto. Which yeah, is his, yeah, which is, so maybe which that's is historically is. inaccurate because every woman found Miyamoto a completely irresistible uh, <laughs> at first glance, including uh, bitter but, old ladies. <laughs> Here's the thing, though. especially bitter like, old ladies. Really, if anything, if we if we're gonna talk about Otsu, that yeah, like she at least the the love story between him and her is actually pretty pretty good. For a yeah, overly romanticized well love story, I mean, like, yeah. you there is a lot of there's actually a lot of plot built into the sort of rise of their relationship and how it unfolds. It actually makes for a pretty good story. These Despite movies being are totally as much about these movies are as much about his redemption and his getting to an equal uh, in, in, in equilibrium the <laughs> equilibrium uh, between uh, bloody violence and humanity. As it is the redemption of her uh, life, really, uh, and and there are there are certain uh, problems with her redemption being uh, him finally loving her. Uh, it's it's not a very feminist. <laughs> no, I think you could probably make the claim um, that the Musashi <laughs> films are not feminist approved. <laughs> I think we yeah, probably, I, I, I don't. Mean, I don't mean to start getting fast and loose with bold claims here, but I feel like you could probably say the Musashi film's treatment of its female characters is uh, borderline reprehensible, if not actually reprehensible. Yeah, it's certainly not not female empowering. But I mean, like, given yeah, that they the are end, essentially can, just hopelessly like, throwing themselves on the ground in distraughtness yeah. whenever the male lead does not immediately. Uh, Return their unrequited love. I feel at that point. <laughs> yes, but you do feel really strongly. At least I did for Otsu. Like you, unlike yes, for Otsu, other, like yes. you, I don't feel for Akemi at all. But like for Otsu, you what do kind of what feel the hell does that say about you if you do feel for Akemi? Is more or less where I'm going to go with? <laughs> oh, <laughs> oh, you might. She's, she she throws herself at him. It doesn't work she's, out. She's then, then like she turns an hour she's later. She An like hour a... later, finds out her mom. Her mom. He. Ch- her mom says he tried to rape her, uh, and as far as Akim is concerned, that's true. So uh, her her point of view is, oh, I love this man, but then he tried to attack my mom, and yet for the rest of the movies, she's just in love with him, and she, that's that's the the childhood love that she looks back on is him rejecting her and then at- trying to rape yeah, his mom. Accurate. Yeah, Akimi is basically an incomprehensible <laughs> character. And it is from yes. the... Well, her and her mother are basically incomprehensible characters and really should just be completely disregarded, in my opinion. They're, they're well, really, except for the fact that they uh, they are important to the they plot. They are, but that doesn't mean that they should be acknowledged. <laughs> yes. yes. Because they are really confusing characters. Like, their, their motivations yeah. as compared to, like, the rest of the characters no. are very hard to follow absolutely they are they are the like even right from the beginning most poorly written main characters in this right from the very beginning from almost the moment we meet them they're like what what, why do you do the things you do what the hell is wrong with you is a is a question that is oft asked of the some of the female characters are oko and akimi yeah what just what the fuck exactly is going on here is a question that i am often found myself asking yeah, and and so you, yeah, we have what three, four female characters in the entire film, and two of them are batshit insane. Yes, and then one of them is just hopelessly yes. in love with uh, Miyamoto, but that that's okay because her unrequited love does make for, or not unrequited love. I should not say that because um, Otsu is eventually love, is very even right from the from basically the moment you do get like from the acting and everything that he does care for yeah. her, but he cares for being a samurai more. So it's not that he doesn't yes. care for her, it's just that it's priorities. Yeah. And so... Uh, well, is there anything yes. anything more specifically yes. we need I to talk, talk about, about here? I talk about the final scene with the bridge. Okay. And the fact that yes. the, the caption is a dirty lie. 
What does the caption say? The caption says two different things with the exact same writing on the same bridge. The first time it says, basically something like, I think, like, I'll be back. And then the second time she looks at it, it says... Forgive me. Forgive me. Now, the actual accurate translation of what it says is, pray forgive me. It's all it's Actually, the accurate uh, thing says, you just got punked. I'm out. Well, I mean, like, it literally (laughs) says, I think it's like, yurushite tamore, which would be like, pray forgive me, or for the love of God, yeah. forgive me, yeah. or something like that. And yeah. um, it never says anything about being back. And I think saying, like, I'll be back in the caption really throws you off because, like, basically, he never says that. He's ditching her no. for good. Yeah. He is, he is, he is, he is meaning to yeah. leave he's, and leave he's good saying, and get her I'm out of sorry, his life. But he is never, ever saying anything about, I'll, I'll catch you on the flip side. And that's why I'm not a yeah. huge fan of that last scene because I feel like what we watched muddles the message. She chases after yeah. him because she loves him. Not because he said, I'll be back and she can't wait. You know? Also, it's a bit uh, different. No, if, if he had actually promised to come back, she would just sit there. She right, would she would have just waited leave. there for 10 years. Says, uh, yeah. please forgive me. Underneath that, uh, you're out of toilet paper. <laughs> this is an accurate translation. Can't stay. Uh, Can't stay. Sorry. Uh, please forgive go. me. Also, you, uh, you're, you may want to, you know, you're out of toilet paper. Uh, yeah. There's, there's a certain. I don't know if I, I don't know if that mistranslation uh, can can you know the entirety of her baffling motivation can be laid at the foot <laughs> no, of that. It's but not, it's certainly but a part of I it. I think it's confusing. I think it's a confusing... For me, it was like, I ended up going back and, like, watching the scene so I could actually read it. I was like, huh? Wait a minute. So why did she come after him? Like, I I felt a little confused about her motivations because I had read, I'll be back. And then, like, in the next movie, we start off with her chasing after it, basically. It's like, huh? Yeah. So, not that we should get into the next movie, but maybe we should. Well, we will. We within, will right within now. Uh, within minutes. So we're gonna we're gonna finish up with this one now, unless unless I anyone else has something to add, real quick. I I think we're good. We we've, we've covered the important parts. We've talked about all kinds of fancy things. Oh yeah. Um. Miyamoto now actually Miyamoto instead of just Takizo. Um, Man, you are bad at Japanese is, uh, er, uh, pronunciation. I am so bad at Japanese say names. That, uh, I can't be hundred percent here. I'm pretty sure that. It is true that he had a different name originally. I'm pretty sure that's not it. Okay. No, no. I think. Yeah, I think. I think from what I've read, just no, well, he I, was born. To yeah, I think what something. we got into, like, I think I read the same thing. Is that like, be, depending on like, he had like many, many names because of the whole like kind of cultural situation at the time, where he would have been yeah. named a Buddhist name and he would have been named a regular name, and yeah. And then there would have been what all the guys down at the pub called them. And, yeah. <laughs> well, uh, that wraps up Samurai Part 1, Masashi Mayamoto. Uh, join us join us next time for Samurai Part 2, Duel at Ikijo. I Duel at, if you bring a sickle to a sword fight, you are gonna get fucked. That is... <laughs> that's, yeah. a, that's the alternate subtitle. Uh, if, this were, if this were an episode of Rocky and Bullwinkle, that would be... Probably not the subtitle because I don't up. think they ever use the word fuck. <laughs> guys, guys, that's like number seven. We are so far beyond PG-13 right that's now. Fine. We okay. only get two. All right. <laughs> Join us next time. We'll talk about that. And Donovan will be back with us for the rest of this series. And it'll be fun, I'm sure. All right. <laughs>
Thank you.